Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to another episode of Human Humane Architecture. Uh, this week I'm going to be hosting. My name is Graham Hart. I'm an architect here in Honolulu. And today my guest is Sid Snyder, who is the uh, former partner of Vladimir Osipov. Um, their firm was Osipov Snyder Architects. And uh, he started in 1957. So today we're going to be going through a bit of Sid's work. And then we'll also be um, talking a bit about the work that he did uh, at Osipov's uh, office, and then uh, we'll go into more detail about Sid's home. So, um, so thanks for joining us, and uh, Sid, thank you for uh, for joining me today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if we can actually go to the uh, the first slide. Oh, actually, the next one. So this is uh, this is kind of where where Sid starts here. Uh, if you want to jump in, but. This, these are the first two firms that uh, Sid worked at here in, here in Honolulu. But where did you uh, originally move here from? Maybe we'll start there. I went to school and grew up in Seattle, Washington. Came here right out of school. Yeah. yeah. And that was like 56-ish or? 57, yes. 57, OK. Yes, okay. All right. Yep. Pre-statehood. Pre-statehood. Yeah. Yeah, that good mid-century era right. of architecture. And so the uh, the first office, or who wound up uh, actually bringing you here? This is an interesting story. Uh, I was recruited by Frank Haynes from a firm then known as uh, Limone, Freeth, Haynes, and Jones. Yep. I stayed there a short time. And that, that firm later on became Architects Hawaii, which is still it did. today. Yes, kind of a correct. Pretty big firm here. Um, so you're there for about six months. Something you mentioned? Maybe less. Maybe less. Yes. Yeah. Um, so right out of school. And then uh, afterwards, you went to go apply at another office? Well, there, there were a lot, of, um, a lot of work in the post-war era then, and not too many architects or qualified people. And that's why Mr. Haynes recruited people to come. Mm -hmm. So I went to work uh, with Osipov, and he had a lot of work of different types. He did a lot of different types of work. Not By different, I mean hospitals, schools, religious, uh, commercial buildings, residential, and uh, always a change, always something new and different. A little bit of everything. Yes. Yeah. And so you started there in 57. And then um, what year did you later become Ospoff's partner? Oh, that was many years later. Yeah. We became an associate after four or five years, and that was for quite a while, but I think it was at the late 70s that uh, we, we were uh, made more of a higher level uh, yeah. co-owners. Okay. And it was planned with Asipov wanting to exit ownership and things, although he, he worked in the firm the rest of his life until he was 91 years old. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Architects yeah. never retire, we just slow down. I guess that's the, Apparently. that's that's the <laughs> rumor. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide. So this was one of the uh, the first projects that you were on, or no? It was being built when I arrived in in uh, Osipov's office. It was a um, a very tall building at twelve floors yep. in Waikiki, actually, in Diamond Head, on the, what's now known as the Gold Coast. Right. And it was unique in that it was a co-op building in which there, the ceilings were lowered from the concrete slab above, and therefore you could move utilities around, including plumbing, and so people could have their own floor plan, and that was a big feature of the developer to allow that to happen. So as a result, the man in, the, in our office was busy constantly with all these different sets of plans. Yeah. So I think there was something like, certainly, 35 to 40 different plans and different Everyone's owners. Everyone's unit was completely different. Uh, yeah, uh, they were all different. Wow. Yeah. So this is, this is Diamond Head Towers, um, Diamond Head Apartments. Yes. 
on the Gold, Co Gold Coast there. And uh, so that's a picture of it on the left there. And then in the middle is uh, actually for one of our uh, Dokomomo tours maybe a year ago when Sid gave a, um, a lovely tour of, of the outside of the apartment. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this apartment building is called the uh, Coral Strand Apartments, and it's right next door. And so, Sid, you, you helped out more on this one? I was actually involved in this one. Um, so I was, I guess you could say, the lead designer of it. And it was the same developer, but smaller, more modest, and more standardized built, uh, built apartments. So everything was the way it was, except for the two floors of the penthouse. So it was an interesting job. It took us a while to get it built and um, came out okay, I think. Yeah, I think it's pretty pretty incredible. And I went and visited it uh, actually just recently this, this past weekend to look a little bit more closely at it. And it's got some great details with the board formed concrete and a couple other things that, you know, make it really simple and, and humble in its appearance. But I think that that kind of came through in a lot of Ossipoff mm. work and came through in some of your other projects as well. I think so. And the uh, interesting thing about both buildings, the Diamond Head Apartments and the Coral Strand, was that we were not dependent on air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the buildings were, the apartments themselves were built so that there was no provision for air conditioning particularly. And uh, they're largely that same way today, I understand. I'm sure right. individually people have added room, room air conditioning sure. to it. So, but that was part of the uh, that was part of being in Hawaii was to have the, the natural ventilation, yeah. and of course these are very desirable because they're both directly on the ocean. Right on the ocean. Yeah. 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 Okay. If we go to the next slide. So this kind of brings us. Uh, so that was 57, 58, 61, maybe. When then what? What year is this? This is. This is when you first bought the uh, your property up on um, Ahupua Place. Well, I'd been here about five years, gotten married, had no children. Um, so my wife and I would look at houses, mm -hmm. something to, we were just renters. And so we <clears throat> looked and looked and one time we came aware of a new subdivision, which ended up being Wailaiki Ridge View Lots. Yeah. <laughs> A whole name. And they had great views. They were, it was a short ride up the hill, and I think uh, the property we ended up with was 300 feet elevation. Hmm. And so it was pretty exciting. And so it was developed by Bishop Estate, where they put in all the improvements, uh, meaning the, the utilities and the hmm. roadway and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you leased it. So turned out that the leases were, for this particular lot that I ended up with, were $6,000. And so it didn't have 6000 but had a couple thousand put together. So we proceeded to buy it, not knowing how we were going to make the next move, which obviously was build something. Yeah. Um, so that was 1962. And uh, my wife, what she did almost immediately was get pregnant. And uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> Now, now we're down to one income, yep. <laughs> so moving right along. So we had it for, for actually seven years before we finally built a house. Uh, but I must say that to their credit, the leasehold system worked in our case yeah. and allowed us to get the toehold, which, uh, which became happily fee simple in a, in a different era in the late 1980s. And right. so that changed uh, the equation a whole lot. And we had the uh, extreme excitement and thrill of we were going to build our own house and we, we would somehow get it built and uh, we would uh, have the pleasure of, of uh, a lifetime you might say being spent in our house which is a, a great thing that i recommend to one and all who yeah if anyone can do it care about things like that so this uh this picture here is of, of the view um, and it's changed a bit since uh, you first bought it in your, when you were 30. Well, the, the nearby houses weren't there yet when we first saw it because yeah. that was a, a ridge that had not been developed. At all, right. And uh, it, Wailaiki was just next door to it. So that, uh, our, that was our view and uh, it was uh, very special. We don't live in this house anymore. We sold it three years ago, but I must say I, I do miss the view. Yeah. <laughs> So if we go to the next slide, 
So this is kind of just a, a Google um, view of, of the, uh, the terrain and, and the site. And if you can just kind of walk us through some of the site conditions that you had to deal with on this once was empty lot. Sure. The lot was steep. It give you an idea that there's a cul-de-sac you see in the house that we're speaking of is the, the one with the five red roofs with a white one in, in between uh, grouped around a courtyard. So the, <clears throat> Uh, the drop that from this cul-de-sac down to the low corner on your right, 60 feet. So that became obviously interesting how to deal with and and uh, and maximize the benefit of 60 feet and but deal with the benefit at the same time. Yeah, harder to build on such a steep site. More expensive too. More expensive. It is. Yeah. So the, the wind came from the upper right-hand corner, which was the normal trade wind. And we had several thoughts about it, but one thing, we'd lived in a similar situation in Makiki Heights, where the wind came basically from the direction of the view. Mm -hmm. And so that means that um, it's, in the long run, not pleasant to have the wind in your face like that. And so you need to uh, somehow get the view at the same time, enjoy the place. Right. And so that led to, if we would park the car at the street, up at the cul-de-sac, and not have a driveway into the property, but drive directly into the garage, we'd have enough room to be flat and have a courtyard. Because mm -hmm. if you have a courtyard that's flat, now you can go out and do things in the courtyard, sit around, have a chair, have a table, um, play a game uh, in, in a situation where it's comfortable, whereas the hillside is hard to do any of those things in. Yeah. And that was precious uh, to, to get, and it's maybe I'm supposed to save this for the end of our little talk here today, <laughs> but um, it was my favorite room of the house, which was not a room at all. Well, and so that's, that's not like a... Let's hold on for a little bit then and take a quick little break. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about um, all the different layouts and all the different rooms inside the house. Okay. Welcome back to Human Humane Architecture. I'm the guest host this week, Graham Hart, and with me is Sid Snyder, and we're going over some of his work and uh, the house that he designed for himself. So we just went through the site and some of his uh, early career, and now we're gonna go through the layout and all the rooms. So uh, right here we have the floor plan kind of superimposed on top of the, uh, of the site plan that we were just looking at. And, um, I think what might be best is actually just to go room by room and kind of walk through the house. Fine. Sounds good? Sounds great. Okay, so here we are at the top where Sid was just talking about pulling up into the cul-de-sac and driving right onto the garage. We had a three-car garage because it looked better than a two-car garage. <laughs> it, was, it was less of a box. We didn't have three cars, but it worked out and it helped the courtyard. Yeah, so then as we move down to the next slide, so this is kind of the picture on the left is walking down the stairs on the side of the garage, garage in the middle, and then the image on the right is actually where the front door is. Yeah, the, the door, the image on the right uh, doesn't show well, but there's a, there's a door there that uh, I would like to just mention 
came from a house on Diamond Head that was going to be destroyed. And it was a one of a pair of garden gates in that house. And it was the same architect that designed the Academy of Arts, now known as the Honolulu Museum of Art. So we, we saved Purdue that. Or something. Yeah. We salvaged it. Yeah. OK, next slide. So then as soon as you walk through that doorway, you come into this space, which is this kind of this corridor, which is open on one side of the courtyard and has this great little raised uh, platform um, in between the courtyard and the hallway, which I think of as, as a great thing for Hawaii because you have this bench to sit down at and take off your shoes. But I think it's a bit more complex than that. A little more complex than that. Well, we needed to do it for the topography, which was extreme but very carefully maneuvered. Uh, the courtyard never overflowed into the house over that wall, and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> Didn't flood. <laughs> okay, next slide. So this is a little bit more, a couple more views of the courtyard itself, um, and looking back from the courtyard through the house. As you see, the, the doors folded up for 100% view. We had to close them at night because there's no screens, as you'll see. They're just one thing about when you fold doors, they don't accommodate the screens. So that was fine. We didn't have any particular bug problem other than the usual friendly neighbors, yeah. roaches, so forth. All right, next slide. So from the courtyard, there's this uh, lanai space that kind of opens out to it. Um, no walls, no, no windows or doors on this side of the, yeah. of the room. Great outdoor space for Hawaii. Yeah, the uh, lanai was reached on the right by the, that was next to the living room. And the door on the left went directly into the kitchen. So the, the plan was to have a table, which you don't see there, but there was a table on the left-hand side where we ate most of the time, but, and deliberately kept any eating, mm -hmm. except for one stool at a counter in the kitchen. So we, we really were outside in that lanai in just about every kind of weather. It's a great space. The next slide. So this is the, uh, the family room, or no, no, this is the deck. The deck, uh, as, yes. as you called it, um, so right off the entryway. And I, I want you to talk a little bit quickly about the, uh, the screen wall here, if you can. Well, the, the screen are simply roof tile cut in half. So they're only half as long, so they're about four inches front to back. And they're in there stacked in that kind of honeycomb pattern with a little bit of mastic in there to hold them in place just in case. And interestingly enough, we found that flies had no interest coming through this. <laughs> so didn't need a bug screen. Yeah. So the next slide. So this space is then right off of that other deck space that we were just looking at. And this one has got these great picture view uh, windows right out into the ocean and um, the exposed CMU and then um, sill vents underneath all of these great windows to modulate all the wind flow. Um, but maybe you could talk real briefly about the, uh, the CMU here and its sure. significance. The CMU is a beach or sandy coral colored block. And on the outside, it would leak a lot if you didn't do something about it. So the outside has thinly plastered cement plaster with a certain amount of beach sand in added to the face of the t plaster to give it color. And on that was applied a clear sealer, oh, maybe every 10 years. And that pretty much did the job, so we did not have water leaking through into the room. On the inside, it's a different story because now we're not worried about water coming from the inside. So <clears throat> what we did was to get rid of the stigma of block was to make the grout or the mortar that you see between the blocks the same color as the block. So it's, it has some white cement in there with uh, beach sand. And then after that was all done, it was sandblasted, which removed the cement entirely and got into the more of the, the beach coral tones. Yeah. And that was it. We, we did seal it, and uh, but it was never painted or sealed or worked after that. Very low maintenance, uh, honest material. Quite low. Yeah. The only thing to do with it was to uh, vacuum, oh, vacuum occasionally. Yeah. yeah, it had you know miniature pukas in it. Yeah. you might say. So next slide. So this is the uh, the dining room space, which is kind of have a different scale to it, a little bit lower and everything. 
Actually, if we could just maybe jump ahead to the to the kitchen, sure. if that works. So the next slide after that. So this is uh, one of the spaces that you finished off last in the house, you told me. Had a bit more complexity with all the cabinets and all the different details that you wanted to bring in there. Well, as you see, it's a fairly moderate to small size kitchen. The island saves the day. The, um, the wood was treated with some lime and then a, a clear finish such as of polyurethane. Um, but I would like to point out that um, when you're standing at the sink, you're looking out directly into that view on, on your left. And when you're at the island, you're never looking into a wall. You're looking across the room or even outside towards the, the lanai. And that seemed to be uh, good for the cook. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So this is uh, kind of set up as an office now, but originally it was just the guest bedroom. I think it has some um, great details to it and different kind of material choices that you had talked about. Um, the redwood here, you didn't stain or anything. It was just kind of left natural. It was the one room that didn't get bleached on the, on the redwood and, and the finish added. By the time we got to it, it was the last room in the house. And um, we'd grown to fall in love with the redwood the way it was and we liked it very much. The picture on your left, I should tell you, is the Mr. Osipov's desk and um, the U-shaped furniture and all that that came out of his office when he retired and that uh, uh, it fit this room very well. So my wife liked it and used it as her office. Yeah. Next slide. So this is the, uh, the master bedroom, which is off of the, uh, the kind of the deck there in the entryway. Um, beautiful view out there, and, and then the sill windows and the vents uh, and everything with the, uh, the roof tiles there. Um, but maybe we jump to the next slide and talk a little bit about the uh, master bathroom, which is kind of interesting um, with all of its different details that you have, including the, uh, the shower that opens out to a walkway. Yeah, Great the view there. Yes, the shower had the view and there was a curtain on it. And we uh, could open the shower door and go outside and keep the windows washed. That was true of this whole side of the house. Okay, well, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So um, maybe we can jump actually then to the, uh, to the last slide. Okay, so this is the view from the outside here. And um, just kind of gives you a better idea of the, the massing of the, the house and wanted to say a couple of things that, you know, one thing that the house is actually still open for, for sale, um, different owners now, but still a great masterpiece that's, you know, kind of being kept here. And so, Sid, if you have some closing thoughts. Well, I just hope it's inspired some of you to uh, think in terms of, of having your own house someday. It's very few things that we have anymore that are custom, even custom clothing is pretty rare. Sure is for me, you know. Yeah. And um, so here's one thing that affects your life uh, greatly to, to have to have your very own house uh, somewhere. It's difficult sometimes, but I urge you to give it a shot if you can. I want to just mention a couple of things about where we're going in architecture, Honolulu in particular, and that we are building tall buildings, 200, 300, 400 some odd feet high. And these are all over town and they're very visible from not just when you're standing next to the building, but miles away, these towers are gonna to be there. They're gonna be there a very long time, I suspect, maybe 100 years or 200 years. Um, they will, they're built very strong. So we're going to see them, so they need the extra care and extra thought to go into for long-term benefit to the city, and to the people who are gonna occupy the houses. And so we've started out trying to do things that are um, with certain planning elements, but I see them disappearing sometimes because the developer wants to make it more apartments. And so uh, for political reasons, perhaps, we say we sell, settle for lower rent for some people to occupy these homes or buy them at a better price but I think that we need to look at the long-term benefits and hear from all of us who care about these things. 
All right. Well, Sid, I'd like to thank you again for joining me today. And um, I hope everyone enjoyed the show. And we look forward to kind of more talk about architecture. And thank you, where Graham. We're, where we're going. Thank you. Thanks, Sid. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.